Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and thank you for joining us in the room and online. Um, my name is Rachel Kite, I'm the Dean of the Fletcher School, and it's my great pleasure just to open and welcome you to this International Women's Day event, where we are so pleased to be joined uh, by uh, Dr. Seema Samar. More, more about her in a moment. Um, so, uh, International Women's Day is quite an extraordinary day. I woke up this morning and uh, my social media feeds and my email and my WhatsApp, and they're just chock a block full of um, friends, colleagues, uh, women from around the world, um, sort of all reaching out to each other. This is the day uh, where we uh, remember those whose path we follow, those who made it possible for us to do the things that we're doing today. And it's the day where we recommit ourselves uh, to uh, the struggle, which sometimes feels like an endless struggle uh, for the rights and dignity of women around the world. It started you know, on March the 8th in 1908, when women in New York took to the streets looking for pay for better conditions at work. Clara Zeitkin, uh, the head of the Women's Bureau of the Social Democratic Party, the SDP in Germany, then in 1910 at a women's conference in Copenhagen said, well, why don't we internationally have one day every year where we just fight for uh, the rights of women? It was in 1914 on the 8th of March that suffragettes took to the streets of London just six months before war was to be declared. And it was on the 8th of March in 1917 that women took to the streets of Russia, Moscow, to argue for bread and peace. Bread and roses came in the 1970s and 1917. It was bread and peace. The point that I want to make is that each of these early manifestations of International Women's Day were actually revolutionary movements taking to the streets and calling for revolution. In 2023, we sometimes are a little scared of that word. A small R, not a big R. What are we really asking for? But in 2023, when we've seen handbrake turn reversals in women's rights and their ability to access them, not just in Afghanistan, which we will hear about uh, later, and not just Iran, but in the United States, in the United Kingdom, across the European Union in many ways, it's everywhere and the endless struggle continues. In 1975, the, international, uh, the United Nations created an International Year for Women, um, from which then the UN started to celebrate International Women's Day as a day uh, where it would bring all of its sort of thinking together. And we've seen in recent years that International Women's Day has been the day when women pour out onto the streets in response to what they see happening politically, socially and economically in their own countries. So whether, uh, whether in Mexico, whether in Korea, whether in, um, uh, in the UK, it, it's this day, this is the day where women try to take the world back a little bit under their own control. But today we are extremely uh, pleased and honored to be able to welcome Dr. Seema Samar as our speaker. I was um, really uh, taken aback and, and very pleased and proud that the Fletcher community and the Tufts community came together last year to make it possible for us to host Dr. Samar here for the next, uh, for this year and next year. She is a distinguished uh, scholar, a distinguished practitioner uh, on the front lines of what it means to make a difference in girls and women's lives. And to have her as part of the faculty is I think a really, um, important statement by Fletcher and we are delighted to have you with us. She is, for those of you who, uh, who don't know her resume, the former Vice President and Minister of Women's Affairs, the former Chair of uh, AIHRC and a member of the High Level Panel of the United Nations Secretary General uh, on Internally Displaced Peoples. Uh, Dr. Samar is an Afghan human rights advocate, activist and social worker who served as the Minister of Women's Affairs of Afghanistan from December 2001 to July 2002. She was the chair of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, the AIHRC, from 2002 to 2019. 
From 2005 to 2009, she served as the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Sudan. And in 2011, she was part of the newly founded Truth and Justice Party. In 2012, she was awarded the Right Livelihood Award for her long-standing and courageous dedication to human rights, especially the rights of women in one of the most complex and dangerous regions of the world. From 2021 to December 2022, uh, Dr. Samar was a visiting scholar at the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard University's Kennedy School, just down the road. And currently she's a visiting scholar at Tufts University at the Fletcher School. Um, it's been a great honor for me to get to know you a little bit well, since you've arrived here. I'm delighted that you can speak to us today on this day of all days. And I'm also grateful uh, to Professor Tyden uh, for uh, coordinating and hosting the discussion with you afterwards. So uh, with no uh, further ado, on this day, on International Women's Day, Dr. Samar, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me and thank you, um, Dean, for introducing me with such a kind words. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to be at Fletcher School and thank you for hosting me and having me here. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start by asking everyone to in order to pay respect to the ones who are survival of violence against women around the world to stand up for 30 seconds and keep the silence. Thank you so much. Um, I'm talking about Afghanistan and the situation in my country. I have to say that I was the first Minister of Women's Affairs in 2002 when I decided to have the 8th March in Kabul in a, in a cinema which was named the only cinema in the country which was named on behalf of a woman and it was burned. So the, the whole structure was, was full of debris. So the Americans gave me some money in order to clean it. So we had the burning wall and destroyed wall, but we didn't have roof on top of us. But we had the Mary Robinson uh, as a high commissioner for human rights and Nulin Heiser on that time from the, um, UNIFEM before the UN Women was uh, changed to UN Women. And uh, all the uh, international community with us, 800 people join us. And it was cold day, but we were very hopeful for the future of the country. And we got promises for, from the international community that they are going to help us and promote gender equality and women's rights in Afghanistan. But after 21 years today, that cinema is built and it has a roof, but the women in Afghanistan do not have the right to celebrate. That ministry in that building was changed to Ministry of Vice and Virtue. Their job is to release a statement and decrease to restrict women's rights. So that is not really I would say not a, a forward for the women in, in Afghanistan, but their rights has been taken and actually the country turned to be a, a open prison for half of the population. I'm just, I just wanted to show some of the um, situation in the country, including it's long ago, it's from 1963 to 1973. So what you see today, in, in the media, um, all these Afghan men with long beard and long hair and, and not really wash themselves with a gun and an aggressive mood and women under the blue burqa, that is not the reality of Afghanistan. This was the reality of Afghanistan when, we, when I grew up. So we had 
we had the, um, the this kind of situation. Women were part of almost in every sector, although I have to say that the country was poor and we didn't have a lot of school in every corner of the country in order to give the possibility and access to education, particularly to the, to the girls. But it was a better country for, for all of us, including myself. I gone to co-education school myself and women, you could see that in 70s, women were almost similar as they are in Europe. So women were involved in, in, uh, in all the sector of the society. You could see that women was uh, working in the uh, technical part of the aviation. Uh, and you can see that women were uh, in the midwifery school without really the kind of hijab that we, are, we are, have to wear. And then we had the, um, unfortunately, the coup d'etat in 1970. Eight, and then the invasion of the um, Russian in Afghanistan. Um, actually, that government tried really to promote women's rights, but in the wrong direction. For example, I give you an example. They uh, made the literacy course some compulsory for women in every corner of the country. So they, they went to the um, very rural areas of Afghanistan and invited people uh, the elders and the mullahs in order to, uh, instead of really promoting and, and convincing them to allow the uh, women to participate on the, on the literacy course, they killed those people, they arrested those people. So they encouraged people, that they, it was a lot of arbitrary arrest and, and anyone who was not with the regime, they were taken and a lot of people were dis, uh, displaced. And, and of course, the pro-Russian government did a lot of violation of human rights on their own way. And the opposition, unfortunately, was, was taking the, uh, whatever the government was promoting for the, at that time government, the pro-Russian and the Russian policy uh, on women's rights, they take it back and then they impose all the restriction on women's, including a lack of um, not allowing them to, to get education and, and restrict their rights um, during that time. Unfortunately, what was happened, the formal education was, was actually ignored by, by the international community. I have to say that the, the US and UK and a lot of other Arabic countries and, and uh, Western countries, they did not support the formal education for, for Afghan refugees. We had more than 7 million refugees in Pakistan and Iran. And you could see the Islamization in the region, the impact on the refugees. Instead, they established these madrasas and they took the Afghan boys in those madrasas to train them, to brainwash them. And the Taliban are the products of those madrasas today. So it was not Afghan made. I, I have to say that they, religion was used as a weapon of war in order to, to um, control, to defeat the USSR, I would say. And USSR was, um, there was a uh, agreement in 1988 in Geneva, where the Pakistan, Pakistan government and Afghan government on that time uh, signed the agreement that the Russian, the USSR will, will withdraw from Afghanistan. And, uh, no women were there. USA and USSR, both of them signed as a witness, as a guarantor for the implementation of the, um, of the, uh, the agreement. Uh, and then of course the USSR withdraw from Afghanistan, the Mujahideen, which was supported by the international community in Pakistan particularly, they established their own government and they went to Kabul they start the fighting and you can see the destruction in Afghanistan. I'm sorry, I didn't click the, 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 um, the slides. So you could see that these are the Mujahideen who took power in, a, in Kabul in 1992. And then they start fighting among each other. Uh, in order not, they were not willing to share the power with anyone. So then we had a lot of uh, a lot of destruction in the big cities, because at least the, uh, before the Mujahideen going to Kabul and establish their own government, 
we had most of the fight in the rural part of Afghanistan as we had with the Taliban in the recent years. But then after they went to Kabul, to Kabul and their big cities, the destruction began in the big cities. We had more refugees coming to Pakistan and Afghanistan. We had a lot of uh, war victims everywhere in the country. And we had uh, people from the cities, although a lot of Afghans were already out, but it was mainly the rural part of the country. And some educated one from the cities were um, came out. And you could find Afghan refugee in every corner of the world. You can even find us in Bangladesh. You can find us in Philippines. In Fiji, who could imagine that people would go to Fiji? Forced marriages, child marriages become a common uh, phenomenon because in a way the families were giving their uh, female uh, children in order to reduce the, the burden on, the, on themselves. So it was become a very common issue. And it was different part of the country was controlled by different Mujahideen group, unfortunately. So extortion, I mean, you name it, every kind of violation of human rights, nothing was safe in the country. Um, on that time, I was, I was running hospitals and schools. Uh, everything was looted on the way to the area. And then when it was reached to the area, the Mujahid, different Mujahideen group was looting in the area in order to control the whole things. In 1994, the Taliban arose in Kandahar. The first thing they did, they closed the bath, public bath for women, and they closed the, the school for the girls. And they were promising on that time that whenever they, um, they disarm all the other groups, then they will open the school for the girls. That was their, um, their condition or reasoning that they will open the schools for the girls when the, the time is, is ready for that. Um, then Taliban took power slowly, in, uh, first in Kandahar and then in Herat and Kabul in 1996, September 1996, they took the power in Kabul. Then they really put all the restriction on women. On that time, actually, we didn't have a lot of educated people in the country, they already left. So it was not a lot of protests against them. There was some protests in, in Herat when women got out, when they closed down the school, but then they start to arrest their husbands and the male member of the family, and they were beaten up. And you, you could see that what Taliban was doing, they were beating up women in the street. Uh, women were not allowed to walk. They, nothing was allowed for women, I mean, publicly. Um, they were not allowed to travel. They were beaten up on the street. You could see on the photograph, uh, although they did not allow. On that time, we didn't have a lot of media. We didn't have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of newspaper. It was only one television that we had, the national television. They just locked the television, and we had only one radio, the national radio, and it, they turned the radio to Radio Shari Shariat. It was their own propaganda, and um. They commit every kind of violation of human rights, particularly of women, and also on minorities, the Hazaras. Uh, they were really mass killing of those people everywhere. Uh, um, you could see that they are also destroyed a lot of historical places, including the Buddha in Bamiyan. And also they, uh, I, I don't know the mentality, they did everything to, to avoid any living things. Like there was very old carpets in the palace, in the presidential palace with some um, birds on it. And they just cut the head of the bird in the carpet. And some of those were blackened as they did this time and cutting the head of the female monarchan behind the, the windows of different shops. Uh, anyway, and 9-11 and happened, and Afghanistan at that time turned to be um, the biggest prison for women, the biggest producer of opium. We were producing, we are still the biggest producer of opium in the world. 
And then the training come for all the terrorists in Afghanistan. And nobody really paid attention. I remember that I, I was here in Washington talking to, um, to Afghanistan desk officer. And I said, this is, I mean, you made these people for us. Then you have responsibility because after the collapse of the USSR and the, when the Mujahideen went, all the United, US NGOs left Afghanistan, let alone the, uh, the political support for the Afghans, not only the US, but the UK and the um, European countries as well. But there were some like Swedish Committee for Afghanistan or Norwegian Committee for Afghanistan doing some small project, but it was not really any development program or any monitoring of the situation because the goal was achieved, the USSR was defeated. Then we had the 9-11 after that and the intervention, the military intervention by the, by the United States and NATO countries and Taliban were removed. Then as I said that we had the um, 8 March celebration in 2002 with everybody who was promising us that um, they will support us. And, they, and the first ministry of women's affairs was established. Uh, although I didn't have the office for two, Two months I was walking around without having office. I remember one day when uh, uh, Ogata, who was the uh, Japanese special representative for Afghanistan, she came to, to see me. I am the, one of the vice chair and also the minister of women's affairs. And I didn't have office. We rented a house and there was some old furniture from the owner of the house in the, in the house. So, it was really cold, it was January. So we found a local heater with diesel and it made a lot of smoke because I don't know that house was not used for some years when we went in. And we tried to somehow to heat up the room. She came as soon as she sat on the couch, the couch was broken. And I was trying to hold myself, my God. I mean, I was completely sweating and, and become red. Um, what to say? And I was apologizing. And then she said, I understand. Because I, I saw her when she was the High Commissioner for Refugee in 1995 in Davos. So we knew each other. Uh, and uh, I, I never forget that. Then later on when she came, when we, I already had established the Ministry of Women's Affairs and I already uh, had an office for the Human Rights Commission. She said, I, I, now I, I think we are going in the right direction. It's proved that we are not going in the right direction, unfortunately. So it was, um, schools were open. A lot of boys and girls were going to, to schools in different parts of the country. You could see the number of the children, we had at least 7 million children uh, back to school, although the number of the girls were not um, e equal as the boys because of lack of facilities. And there was a lot of, uh, still a lot of um, dropout of the younger girls when they were reaching at the age of puberty because in some of the rural areas, they had to walk for two hours and there were no toilet for them to use and so on. And would not a lot of female teachers. But women came back. We had the constitution in 2004. For the first time in our history, we had the um, equal rights for men and women. So women were in business, they were in sports, they were um, almost in everything. They were in music. We had the different um, political uh, process in the country, including the, uh, the constitution. Uh, we had the election in 2004, the first election, uh, presidential election. You could see in this photo, this lady, that the day when we had the election, uh, it was really snowing and it was really cold. This lady who was 82 years old, and she walked in the snow with her stick. And I, I was thinking that it's first time in her life, most probably it's last time in her life that she came. Although, although she might vote for the one 
who the male member of the family told her to do. Because we were monitoring the, the political rights in the election day when some woman came with the photos of the, uh, the one the family member gave. And then she was comparing on the voting paper, on the ballot paper, with the different photos in order to find the right person. And most of the time, they, they even vote for the wrong person, not the one, they, the photo they brought. But it was kind of a hope in participation on the political process in Afghanistan. Uh, and for, women were in police and army. We were, I personally was supporting a lot the uh, women in police and the army because we really need, if we want really to provide protection to women, we need their full participation in every way, particularly on police because uh, there's a lot of violence against women and there's a lot of um, domestic issues uh, that needs women to, to feel comfortable to talk and to tell what is going on and what's happening. We were able to have, um, it was 3,200 uh, female in the police and we had more than 1,700 women in army. You could see their faces, uh, they were so happy to be. But now they are, they're trying to look for places to, to hide. Uh, women were pilots. I mean, you can see the, the one in the left, she actually came for, for uh, training here and there and she didn't go back, but the other one with her husband, both of them were, were pilots and they were flying this small um, aircraft in different parts of the country. And, and I mean, when you look at her, um, size of her body, she is quite small, but she was so brave to fly the, the planes in a very remote part of the country and not really a, a proper airport. But they were wanted to be part of those um, issues. Women were participating on everything. You can see the robot team of Afghan girls, they, uh, they were actually participating on the competition. Uh, they are from Herat and they won the competition and women were part of the protest. You could see the number of the people in this protest. Although unfortunately the number these days are not very high because people are really afraid and Taliban are so brutal uh, killing people. And as you know that they, um, they did not open the, um, the school for the girls uh, from the beginning as they took power in 2021, uh, 15 of August after the withdrawal of the US, or, um, US troops from Afghanistan. I think you all saw the news and you saw the desperate situation when the people fall from the planes when they were holding themselves on the tire of the plane. Nobody would do that. They were not uh, uneducated people who could not understand. The two person who fall down from the plane, one was a medical doctor. The other one was a graduate from 12th grade and he was football player. But you could see the desperation in that moment that people were, were facing. Um, yes, they, as soon as they took the, um, the power, as I said, that they closed down the Ministry of Women's Affairs and they start to erase completely, eliminate women from the social um, sphere of the country. So they cannot go to school. Uh, at least in 2022, they allowed the, the girls to go to university and then they, they closed down that as well last December. So I, I think it's, it's really important to see that the basic, basic rights of, of women in, in that country is violated and everybody is watching. We, I mean, I, what I'm saying, it was not Afghanistan that forgotten or abandoned like before, but it was Afghanistan that everybody was involved. 
and they were talking and doing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of support for them. And they promised last year, the whole year. I mean, they are people who still um, advocating that the Taliban are changed. They they are uh, the young Taliban who are against the old elderly ones, which is not the case. That's why they they the agreement in 2021. Uh, yes, February. 2021, 2020 was signed with the Taliban and 2021 was the withdrawal of the troops. I mean, President Trump said that it, they will withdraw at the end of the May, but then when President Biden took the, the power or won the election, then he promised that he's going to assist the situation. And then, but he decided to, to withdraw the troops before they, September 2021, and you saw the, the situation, the disaster which was happened in Afghanistan. So only a few women, I mean, around 50 were out in Kabul street few days. They were beaten up, they were shot on, and they were arrested uh, by Taliban. And then they announced that they, they will Women has to be to cover themselves. If they don't, the male member of the family will be arrested. So practically, they put their representative within each family. I mean, they empower the patriarchy, and and somehow you cannot blame the male member of the family because they will be beaten up, they will be arrested, and nobody. I mean, they will be killed, and nobody is there to ask, and they're not accountable to anyone. So the poverty increased in the country. And this is the girls when they promised that they are going to open the school on 23rd of March last year, um, the secondary school. When the girls went to the school, the door were closed and some school door was open, but then the girls were sent back in tears. You can see the girls are, are crying here. And of course, the, uh, the worst humanitarian crisis happened in Afghanistan because everything was collapsed. I mean, we had at least 350 security forces in police and also in the army, uh, including the intelligence service in the paper. But in reality, even if it was 250, suddenly they were uh, like gone. The day when the Taliban came in Kabul, they actually fought in Herat and Kandahar and Hilmand and Mazar. They had a lot of casualties, but in Kabul, because President Ghani left the country with his small team that he had, there were no shot. I mean, I, I know these female police officers. She said she went to one of her, she was responsible for gender, uh, department of one police station. She goes like every day, usual um, with her uniform. And then at 10 o'clock, they say Taliban came. And she was saying that she was shocked and she was crying because she didn't know where to put the uniform. And she said that she was watching that the people was throwing their uniform and trying to get out of the, um, out of the office. Um, so then the very small number of women, as I said, they're participating on the, and this is the, um, the humanitarian situation. Women are 50, 60, sitting in front of the bakeries waiting for a loaf of bread if somebody comes in and buy a bread and distribute among them. It's so sad in a way they hide their, their, their faces under the burqa. I'm not supportive of that, but the identity is not there who's bagging, but it shows that these are women who do not want to be bagger on the street, but they are forced to. Um, I put some photos here and I wanted to say that the, the leaders, from Democrats and Republican. Both of them promised us, uh, and I promised me, 
as the minister or the chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, that they will stay with us and they will not abandon us again. Because they were saying that we learn from our mistakes in the past. So um, my recommendation to the international community, uh, one, I think they can really put um, or impose stronger sanction on Taliban, including freezing their assets in Arab countries and Pakistan. They have businesses, they have their families there. Uh, and of course, the, the tra travel ban on the Taliban member. Um, you, you could see that in the Security Council, unfortunately, sometimes they, the supporters of Taliban, although they, now they are not sure if they should support or not, um, they're trying to remove the sanction on, on Taliban, which was put by the uh, Security Council before. Um, the Taliban inhuman policies towards women should not be accepted. I think they, they are saying that we should be engaged with Taliban and yes, they can be engaged with Taliban with clear message that they are not going to negotiate on human rights values and principles. Um, relief distribution is also needed in the country, but that should be in dignified way not to make the people more dependent to the relief program because that is not going to help. Uh, and it should be, women should be part of it. I mean, the, the recent uh, ban on, on women working with different NGOs because they, they even put restriction on that recently. And the two days ago, there was a clip of one of the Taliban talking in the, during the Friday prayer, saying that women should not wear anything which is, has embroidery because Afghan, Afghan women really do a very fine embroidery. And he says that it is quite nice and they should not be uh, even wearing that. Those blue burqa that you see are all made in China. Those are, are machine embroidery. Even that is not allowed to be, uh, to be used by women. Um, <clears throat> the relief program should be included with the um, uh, access to health and reproductive rights, particularly with, uh, on contraception, because our population increases much more than our development uh, in the country. Those will be uh, uneducated, unemployed people and they can be used by this terrorist group easily and by gang groups and criminal groups, such as uh, people who smuggle the, the opium and make those, uh, use those people. Because the children, people have a lot of children and children are used during the opium collection as a labor because they pay more. Um, well, there's a lot of recommendation, but um, the, there's one recommendation that I insist that the gender apartheid imposed by Taliban on Afghan women was not defined before in any other international law. Um, apartheid was always known because of the um, racial apartheid, which was in South Africa. But this gender apartheid of Taliban is an act against humanity because it's not only the problem of Afghan people and Afghan women and Afghan family, but it is a problem against humanity and a problem for humanity. So I don't want what the history has been repeated in Afghanistan. I do not want to see the history to repeat in the other countries as well. Um, so I would say that um, human rights are not Western value. We should not always use this, that the human rights is Western value. It's not applicable in Afghanistan. It's not implementable. It is human value. We all would agree on that. And the people in Afghanistan and women in Afghanistan deserve to, to also live with dignity and rights. And um, the final point that I would like to mention or make here is that 
there's a lot of attention paid to uh, the, this slide I, I wanted to show you uh, because the the black and white because on that time there were no color film as far as I remember that's the year that I went to university so the 8 March women's International Women's Day was celebrated by women in Afghanistan, you could see. And then now in 2023, you see women under that blue worker. So the 8th March in 2023. Um, what I would like to conclude is that the, the war which is going on in, in Ukraine attracted a lot of attention or diverted a lot of attention, which people in Ukraine deserve to be protected. And I feel a lot of solidarity with them because I understand I lived through that situation myself. But putting all the attention only on Ukraine and ignoring the situation in Afghanistan will not help the situation in Ukraine. So we need to also pay attention to the situation in Afghanistan. And I stop here and thank you so much once again for participating and thank you, Madam Dean, to be with us today. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here as well. I'm Kimberly Titan and I direct the Gender and International Intersectional. I'm thinking about International Women's Day, Intersectional Analysis Program. I'm joined by Rohini Roy, one of our outstanding law students, organizer of our annual conference, organizer extraordinaire. Does this work? Can you hear me? Wonderful. So I just came from a class on the genocide in Rwanda where the international community failed rather massively. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to you right now. And to, at times, I think the international community is a really cruel fiction and uh, certainly has failed so many people. So what does allyship look like? You've listed some items there, but at the end, you said something that really struck with me, one of your last PowerPoints. The problem will not stay only in Afghanistan, and that's because the problem wasn't only concocted in Afghanistan. And the, you know, the frame of civil conflicts frequently erases what happens beyond the boundaries of a nation state and all of the interests that somehow disappear and want people to figure this stuff out on their own. What might more effective allyship look like right now? I imagine there are women organized right now under, yeah. under the table mm -hmm. in Afghanistan who are fighting for their rights. And I'll say where I'm going with this, and I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on it all. Um, I worry about the politics of saving brown women from brown men. Well, let me explain what I mean. I hope that doesn't sound crass. But you know, some have argued the war on terror was the US first feminist war. We got to go save those women from those men. And it was one of the way of getting even feminists, secure feminists, on board with these interventions, which have not left. Uh, things looking much better from, from my perspective and from what you've just presented today. Can you say something then? It seems to me more military intervention might not be the way we, we should be headed. Mm -hmm. Although we saw the desperation of people when troops withdrew. Can you say more about the international community at large? It's recalcitrance to intervene at times when it could make a difference or it's incapacity to intervene and what allyship in its non-militarized register might look like? Um, well, I think the, the Afghanistan case is a collective failure of all of us. So it is the Afghan people, it's the Afghan government, of course, first of all, and then the Afghan people and international community in United Nation. Uh, so I think it requires collective action to overcome the problem that we have in Afghanistan. One, I think it's really important that Afghan people are united and they really stand against this kind of uh, um, 
dictatorship that we have or people who impose their mentality on the rest of us. And, and, and the only country who doesn't have constitution is Afghanistan. So we need really uh, the people of Afghanistan to uh, stand. And the international community can support those people and stand with those people. Uh, I think education is key and we really need to promote education in any price, but quality education because Taliban was also in a way use the education and now they are saying that we are changing the curriculum and make it more Islamic. But I'm afraid that they will turn all of our new generation to Taliban, which, which will be uh, a longer term problem. It, then they, on the international community, I think, international community also should be united. Uh, and UN still have some leverage if they have your um, security council comes together and, and decide. I think the only way would be that a lot of pressure should put on Taliban and they should, I mean, every possible pressure, including reminding them that they are committing the war crimes and crimes against humanity and they will be kept accountable for their action. So people forget when they, uh, when they destroyed, for example, Buddha in 2001, when they massively killed people in Afghanistan, the Hazaras particularly in Afghanistan during that time. People forget, forget that. And they are now saying, okay, Taliban, I mean, you, can, you, you might saw the, the news, the EU representative was in Afghanistan thanking Taliban for um, security and for reducing corruption. But there is no money that they can be corrupt. The already they have, they are corrupt. Then you can, they sell the passport, which was 5,000 of money uh, when there was a republic regime. Now they are selling it $2,000. That is corruption. I mean, they, they force people, they extort from people. That is corruption. So uh, somehow international community tries to, to say that the Taliban is the reality of the country, that it's true that the Taliban is the reality of the country. But as I, I, I was trying to say that, that Afghanistan was not always like Taliban. We, had a, we still have a lot of good people. And I think UN should, should make a plan and push Taliban for maybe under the UN supervision to a transitional government, maybe for three years or so, to have a constitution and a peacekeeping in order to have uh, election and then people can elect even if it's Mullah Omar, if it's supported by the people, it's fine. But we have seen that the Taliban member standed for election in 2005 to be a member of the parliament. They did not win the election, although the election had a lot of problem. But even with those problematic, um, fraudulent election that we had, they were not able to win the election. So they were refused by the people. So now today they are imposed on people because of their violent and brutality, um, violent act and brutality. So people cannot raise their voice. I mean, you <clears throat> women were journalists. They, they told them that they cannot be, um, they cannot represent present themselves in the, um, in the media. They have to wear hijab. I want to turn it over to Rohini, and then we're obviously going to open it up to, for um, all of you who I'm sure have many questions. I did want to ask something else. You ended on the note of the media. So at one point you had only one TV channel. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that there was a lot of curating of what news was presented. I have a feeling. Now we have social media. And I'm always asked, and I think it's such a good question. I mean, within 
the realm of social media and the capacity, is there less ability for states to so radically control the images that are in circulation when we have cell phones and whatnot? What is what do you think about that? Well, I think the technology and social media helped a lot of people, not only the Afghans, the technology, because we, we were not able to document everything that the USSR done in Afghanistan because we didn't have the facilities. And during first Taliban, because they did not allow camera, if the people had a camera or television in their house, they were, were punished for that. And they were arrested. You could see television were hanging everywhere because they were breaking the television and they were beating up and arresting the, the owner of that television. But it's also increased the hate because Taliban also created a lot of Twitter account and Facebook and female names. And they spread the, the news and, and writing uh, in their favor. So there's no, of course, it's, it, it helps a lot because the, the people um, filmed the violation of human rights by Taliban and then put in the social media. But they, there was an execution of a person in one of the province. People could not really take a photo or film because they took all of people's telephone. So they do control. There's not a lot of a lot of uh, news about. I mean, the about the the problem between Taliban or their violence, because they control, uh, and they control the social media. People are are arrested because of uh, posting something, if they are in Afghanistan. Well, firstly, thank you so much for all of your work and also this wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. I especially enjoyed you um, bringing our attention back to the fact that human rights are indeed not just Western values, because that is something I do feel very personally about. Um, one of my favorite writers, um, feminist killjoy extraordinaire, Sarah Ahmed, um, says to live, a, to live a feminist life means to make everything something that can be questioned. And she also says that when you expose a problem, you pose a problem. Mm -hmm. So in so many ways, your existence here in the United States, all the work that you've done before that, you've exposed some very um, systemic problems that not just Afghanistan, but a lot of countries face, but especially in your context. So I just want to ask you two interrelated questions. First, what does living a feminist life mean to you? And secondly, how, what drives you to continue doing this? Well, um, I believe on those principles. And I, um, I took a lot of risk for that, to be a feminist and to be to be what I am. Uh, I mean, from restriction of my on my movement, and a death attack to kill me, the death threat all the time by different groups, not only by. In my case, it was not only the Taliban, but it was the people in the government also because I was calling for accountability. I am calling for justice and I still call for accountability and justice. That's why I'm saying that people have to be reminded that they are accountable, uh, accountable for their action. But I think I believe on that and I had a commitment and I'm willing to take the risk in order to be able to help the new, the, um, new generation of the country. Because in 2001, 2002, during the uh, emergency we had in Afghanistan, so it is long to talk about the Bonn Agreement. Bonn Agreement was the, the, um, the agreement that the Afghans in the international community were agreed that we will have a new new roadmap for Afghanistan. 
Then we had the emergency Loijerge, and Loijerge is a traditional Afghan way of um, coming together and agree on something, which are, I, I always oppose because it's not elected people, it's selected people. Selection is not different than election. But during the emergency Loijerge, there was an attack on me and they wanted to kill me and it was people in the government. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, in the middle of the night, um, one in the morning, UN had to come to, to my house with the security forces from the international community to take me to the UN uh, guest house because they wanted to kill me that night. And it was people within the government, people whom I was sitting in the same room with them. So I think then the, um, the president, President Karzai and the UN both, I mean, they, were, they wanted to send me somewhere as an ambassador. And I said, no, because if you want to send me outside, it means that we don't have space and nobody else will raise their voice and stand for, the, for their political rights or, or their human rights. So I, I refused to go. And I remember that President Karzai told me that I cannot protect you. And I said, I try to protect myself. I mean, unless you don't want me to be in the government or in the state institution, I'm willing to leave that job, but I don't leave the country. And you don't have the right to, impose, to push me out of the country. And he was, no, I cannot protect you. And I tried to, he said, he will try to talk with the Hazara leaders in order to provide a Hazara bodyguard for me. And I said, no. Then I called the Hazaras, the Hazara leaders. And I said, don't accept what the president proposed because then they will kill me and say that it was your own people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I have to say that even those people who wanted to kill me later on, they came, they uh, at least confessed that we respect you because you stand for that values and principles. I think we need to stand for those rights. I mean, I personally think it is difficult. It's not easy but it is not impossible. And we need to do that because we have to live with dignity, which is not a big demand. It is, it is, it is our rights. And I keep saying that, in fact, our existence is our rights. So nobody can take, take it from us. Uh, but, I have to say that as, as um, our Dean said already that it is a war against women everywhere. So we, I think there are, there's no doubt we achieved a lot, but there is a pushback. The rights which was given 50 years ago, they are taken back and it's everywhere. I, I showed the, the photos from Afghanistan that is, I did not make those. And, and I mean, why? Because you're born as a woman or as a female, as a girl, and you don't have to show your face. And according to our religion, everybody is made by God. So these people want to, to um, to fix the mistake of the God and they, they want to be a police of God, who put them as a police? Mm -hmm. Do God needs the police to protect his um, capability? So it is a lot of contradiction and I don't know. I, I, I'm hoping that the female member of the families of the Taliban will, will stand up against them. 
and we all need. I mean, the young generation, really, you need to train your sons in a better way because they are ours. And we need to train our sons to be feminists. Well, I agree with that. And I do have to mention that that is something also that I feel very passionate about. And the fact that there's barely any men in this room is something that we really need to work on. Yes, we all have a, lot, a long way to go. I think then our unity on principles is important, that we should stand for that and we should fight for it. I mean, even in this room, we don't have a lot of men. Thank you for the one who came. Two. No, it's, there's a couple. Three. Four, I would imagine some of you have questions. Pardon me, which is why we have the microphones there. And I think we definitely have time to hear from you. Hi, Dr. Summer. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I'm very curious to know about um, when you first started off as a young Hazara woman in Afghanistan, uh, you were going to college or started in medical school. What were your inspirations um, to be a humanitarian for human rights, especially for the Afghan women? Um, and then what advice do you have for another young Hazara woman who is just starting off her career? Thank you. Well, I think. Uh, um, I had to marry to go to, to university, so I was not allowed to go before my responsibility was given to another, another male. But I, was, I have to say that I was lucky that I had a, a, a good man who promised that he will do everything to facilitate my education. Uh, and I have to say that my father was was criticized by the community that he gone to Hajj and did the, um, the Islamic performance. I mean, he was really devoted Muslim, but uh, his daughter is going to school without really a proper hijab. But he he did that, allow us to study until the twelfth grade. But then we had only one university. It was in Kabul, so I, I studied in Helmand and I gone to co-education school in Helmand 60 years ago. Uh, um, but then when it comes to for me to go to Kabul to study, my father said no. Then I had to marry and go to university. And I was married and I had a child, and, but I studied. And of course, I, I lost my first husband, was taken by the government, and I never saw him. It was, we were just, it was my fourth year in the, in the university. But I continued my education because I thought that education is the tool that I can use it to be on my, stand on my own feet. And I say this because I, when I compare myself with my cousins who had no unfortunately, had no access to education, the difference between me and them. And then I really was thinking that when you get education, when you get the knowledge, if you don't use it for positive change within the society, you just bury that knowledge under the, under the mud or the, under the ground rather than, that's why I think any, any student, young student, Hazara, non-Hazara, anybody, particularly in Afghanistan, we need to, to get the knowledge and use the knowledge for positive change in every country. Here in this country, if the young, the youth participate on the election, unless you change the political uh, system, you will not achieve your rights. I mean, I was, I was surprised at the number of people who participated on the last midterm election. I don't know the system in this country, but as much as I know, it was not as, as high as it should have been after the ban on abortion. It is your daily life. It is your rights. So I think it's everywhere. 
unless we stand for our rights, nobody is going to give our rights as a gift. So we have to fight for it. And that fight would be easier if we are united. If you are committed to. Other questions? Good evening, all. Thank you, Dr. Samad, for all the work that you do, especially with the Shahada School. My question tonight is, how do we empower and educate women to engage in the agenda of the radicalized, gender-inclusive feminin feminism movement and not just be warm bodies? Uh, yes, I think, uh, as I said, that it is really important to have quality education because education in Afghanistan was politicized and it was all about the jihad and, and, and all those issues rather than um, to be updated scientific education. Um, Yes, I started the schools. It was not easy, but I, I want to say that I started the boys' schools first. Um, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, I started with the girls' school because there were no girls' school. And I started with a very small amount of money um, for the school. And I have to say that we, some of my students now has PhD in teaching and in Harvard. Uh, other day, I, I got an email from a girl from Harvard. She is in a medical, fourth year of her medical, a Hazara again. And she said she born in the hospital that I started in my hand. So I, I feel that I did something positive. I don't know how many girls and boys born in my hand, but one, uh, one other boy who, who also, um, I, I helped her mother to deliver him. He's now teaching in the, at Harvard Law School. So those are small things that I, I did. And I feel that what I did, actually I changed the life of some of the girls. Uh, or some people in Afghanistan. And I, I think even they, they abolished the, the Human Rights Commission that I really did spend a lot of sleepless night for it. But I think they did not, cannot take the knowledge from the people about their rights. It's not a lot, but whatever they, they, uh, they raise today about their rights, either in Afghanistan or outside of Afghanistan. That is something that uh, the Human Rights Commission did in the country. Of course, there are um, some NGOs who also worked on, on human rights, but the commission was the, the main um, backbone of all the human rights in Afghanistan. And I, I personally, I, I don't want to, expressed that I did a lot of I'm a hero but I took a lot of the risk on on those issues I mean there was time that um, some of the world art a lot of them really collected people in the in the Kabul stadium and they were shouting dead to to human rights I mean they did not say Sima Samar but dead to human rights was referred to Sima Samar and it was, they did everything to block, including the amnesty law that they, um, they uh, made in the parliament in 2007 and they passed it. They made it as a law because they want, they stop every kind of accountability for their action with that law in the country. Although the president did not sign, he promised that he will not sign, but they, they were able to pass the law. And that's an impunity law or amnesty law, whatever they call it. But we were calling it impunity law because they, they showed that they, uh, the impunity culture would be something continues in this country. And they, unfortunately, it continues. 
And I think it's important for the young Afghan um, generation to document what is happening in, in the country. We should not avoid the history. History should be written properly, not by the, uh, as I was calling that Sultan or the King was saying what to write in the history. But these days, the history, th thank thankful to the, to the technology that is documented by technology. And we okay. should document those and keep it for our young generation. We have time for one more question. One more question. <clears throat> Thanks to the men. There's five of them now. Yeah, I think more, maybe more than five, but yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Smar, for, for your talk. And I uh, can't get enough of your your voice. It's it's very um, refreshing here. We, we, we all appreciate it. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about and after taking classes with Professor Tyden and others is sort of this, this dynamic between uh, fear and rage. I mean, on the one hand, you have fear, which often surfaces as anger or um, you know something that is reactionary, whereas rage is much more difficult to define. And it's kind of something that we may look to people like you or others for, for, to, to, help, to help us understand better. Um, so <laughs> when, when it comes to, to those kinds of questions, what do you think? What, what are, wh how can we, uh, as men, maybe um, think about think about that? Well, I think um, I I advise the young Afghan generation and Afghan students, or um, the one who had the chance to go to university, that don't get panic. Because the, the problem that we see, the problem that exists in Afghanistan or uh, on the other part of the world is not going to be solved only by shouting and getting angry and, and, and throw stone or pick up a, a gun. It requires a proper thinking and management. If we had a leadership in the country to manage the, the situation, to guide the international community. We were not able to guide the international community because everybody was doing their own job, their own way of, of dealing with, uh, with Afghanistan and Afghanistan case. We would have not been in this situation again. So it requires patience, but commitment on values of human rights. That we should not lose our patience, that it's not going to work. So even my own family, they're saying, it doesn't work. Saying, why not? Or for example, some of my, um, let's say my student or my uh, supporter, when they see something on social media against Sima Samara, they get so upset. And I said, it doesn't matter because I know what I'm doing. It's important that I am committed on the principles of human rights and I, what I'm doing. I'm not trying to do harm to the others, to the majority, but um, of course to criminals is different, but I'm not really trying to, even for them, I mean, I was standing against that penalty. I was standing against torture of the Taliban and Taliban leadership. Loudly, not to, to, to make them happy, but because of their human dignity, because of the principle that I was believe on it and, and, and trying to protect. So I don't know if I give you the proper ex answer, but. I think you need patience and you need to stand on the right side. 
not on the right political side, but <laughs> on the right. Just to clarify that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And thank you so much, living a feminist life and an ethical life. And I also think it's wonderful to have somebody who remains optimistic. Because I do think sometimes we can get quite worn down. Um, sometimes the evidence out there in the world gives us reason to feel worn down. And so I really appreciate that you sit here with humor, with compassion, even for those with whom you disagree. You defend the rights of those, even though you might want to like slap them a little, but I, I made that part up. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate the fact that this is something that you stand for. And thank you for sharing some of this with us tonight. Thank you so much.